you're back on Niaga Awani. When speaking about halal, Nina, uh, most people will immediately link this to the food industry. But not many people are aware that halal certification does not only apply to the food industry, but also applies uh, to water, the es uh, essential for daily consumption, as well as residential and industrial usage. In fact, the certification is more for the water filtration process than the water itself. Southeast Asia is home to more than 20 240 million Muslims, which stands at 42% among the overall population. And this shows the market needs for halal compliant products, including water and public facilities such as a swimming pool and ablution pool for, uh, are considered an essential in the region. Halal certification plays a key role in countries such as Malaysia to indicate that the products are assured in terms of religious compliance, safety and hygiene and is potentially becoming a future direction for water filtration industry as its significant uh, is undeniable. All right, joining us this morning is Mr. Harfizi Hassan, the Manager of Public Affairs and Special Projects of Water Co. Malaysia. Good morning, Mr. Harfizi. May I know what is the Hi, current morning. market position of the water manufacturing industry in Malaysia uh, for the commercial, also uh, residential usages? Well, uh, according to research and market study uh, in 2021, there was about 400 million of US dollar water purifier market in Malaysia and uh, it's, it's estimated to be more than 700 million in between 2023 to 2027. The trend is increasing and uh, and as a leading of water manufacturing industry in Malaysia, we have positioned our product on the right path and the demand for water manufacturing industry is booming. Thus, to have this water filter for domestic use and for commercial use is in need and for such uh, corporate office, commercial building, along with the surging demand from residential places are driving the growth of Malaysia water purifier in the next five years. All right, um, is there a demand for halal certified water usage and is it becoming a trend in Malaysia? Yes, a halal certified product in Malaysia is a growing business trend. This includes halal certified water usage. Malaysia Investment Development Authority, MIDA, in their report September 21, 2021, says that there are a sizable market of halal products for which uh, about to 1.9 billion Muslims in the world and approximately to 24% of global population. Thus, this will be a significant possibility and breadth of halal products and services available to the commercial sector. It will also include for other segments such as food and beverages, pharmaceuticals, personal care and cosmetic, and up to financial services. Halal Industry Development Corporation, SDC, project the global halal of halal industry to reach about 10 trillion ringgit by 2024. Another report by MIDA, uh, <coughs> produced by Ministry of uh, Industrial Trade, reported that halal, our current halal uh, market is valued about 300 billion ringgit which is contributing to 7% of country GDP. And this figure projected to grow further up to 400 billion ringgit to account for 11% of GDP by 2030. By looking at their data, the halal certified water filter is definitely one of the parts of the growing trend in halal, especially halal certified water filter. Alright, Mr. Fiji, would you be able to share the investment in uh, applying and producing halal certified water filtration technologies and how will the halal compliant operation affect business uh, return on uh, investment? Yes, uh, to have halal certified water filtration system is challenging. Uh, we started with uh, appointed halal consultant, conduct halal awareness program and trainings, and we established halal committee. Once we go deeper, it might be some of our processes need further clarification on halal status material. In some extent, we have to find alternative suppliers to substitute for halal material. And some we have to send to halal verification lab as to verify our material use for our process uh, is not using suspicious material and comply with halal requirement. It is, yes, it is cost also cost money and time, but we feel to meet Muslim friendly product could expand our business segment and reach out. It's affected ROI in long run, but we could establish our product in halal world locally and globally. 
So, in your opinion, how does the demand of halal certified products impact the industry players in the operation and R&D to meet expectation of the Muslim consumers? As I mentioned earlier, there is huge opportunity of halal product globally and of course in our country too. The demand of halal certified product is growing exponentially and it's a great opportunity to tap in. In my opinion, those industry players that would like to get their product, get halal certification, must revisit their origin of raw material, sourcing channel, supply chain, and, and, <clears throat> and processing to make it sure halal compliant, which might be thorough and be, it will be worth it. Once halal product is certified, the final product not only could reach Muslim, but non-Muslim too. The halal certification is to make sure all the material used comply with certain quality and hygiene standards. Okay, maybe a last one. Uh, in your opinion, should government and regulations uh, address opportunities for greater halal compliant water filtration processes in Malaysia? Yes, they should. Let's take one example. Even in, even in FMB segment, may want to get a halal compliance product. Uh, one of the requirements for them is to install a water filtration. This one of the SOP. I think it will not stop there. Anything that involves to any consumption that required for commercial and domestic use and a part of processes to get halal endorsement, halal water filtration, it will always be a requirement. As, a, as we know that Muslim population in Malaysia is over 60%, the market for halal product is huge and I believe that so many regulations has been placed to address the halal compliance. Well, in July 2022, Halal Development Corporation HDC, the Halal Custodian for Halal Economy, updated that 10,000 companies has halal certificate and they expected by 2030, uh, it, could be, it will be about 50,000 companies with their halal certificate. It's approximately five-fold increase. This indicates the government has moved to the direct, right direction and placed the right opportunity for the greater halal compliance towards to embrace quality and hygiene standard, environmental free, quality-free practice as well as ethically sourced material. All right. Um, thank you very much. Even, uh, but the government is also confident that the, that the, our country halas export will increase, will improve by 42 billion ringgit, uh, which uh, has a pace before the pandemic, which is 40 billion ringgit. So I want to say thank you very much uh, for the insight, Harfizi Hassan, Manager, the Public Affairs and Special uh, Projects and Water Co Malaysia, on sharing of the insight uh, to help her understand better how the Hala significant play a significant role for Malaysian to have access and even enjoy clean and safe water. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Harfizi. Sementara itu, bagaimanakah trend industri makanan kita dan bagaimana inovasi boleh membantu dalam menjamin keselamatan bekalan makan dan mampan? Saksikan temu bual mengenai perkara ini bersama Lee Yong Sheng, Vice President Commercial Tyson Foods International APEC. Wartawan Nina Rosman ada laporannya. Malaysia's inflation increased 3.4% to 127.4% in June 2022 as against 123.2% in the same month of the preceding year. The food index increased 6.1% and remained as the main contributor to the rise in inflation during the month of June 2022. So definitely we see food security and sustainability is imperative to feed the growing population. So how food is grown and produced and what types of food are consumed and how much food is wasted have major impacts on the sustainability of the world's food system. The main focus now is how can we improve food access and innovation on food security and explain further on this. Join us now is Liang Cheng, Vice President Commercial Tyson's Foods International APEC. Thank you, Cheng, for joining us. So, uh, Cheng, Tyson has been in Malaysia for a while now. I'm sure the demand is there, but how is the competition like for Tyson for now? You know, it's a pleasure to join you uh, today. I think uh, Malaysia is one of the most attractive countries from a protein consumption standpoint. So in fact, uh, Malaysians consume about 50 kilograms of poultry or chicken on, on an annual basis, and it is amongst the highest globally. So obviously there is a very attractive and huge market uh, in Malaysia itself. And Tyson is one of the players uh, in the market. Since entering the market uh, via acquisitions in 2018, the company has invested in upgrading our facilities, adding additional capacity, and more importantly, building new capabilities for our teams so that we are able 
to provide better quality protein formulations. So uh, in short, it is a very attractive market. And as a company, Tyson Foods is committed to grow together in Malaysia. So, and then definitely, what is the scale of Tyson's farm in Malaysia and how does it contribute in elevating Malaysia's role and prominence in the seafood supply chain? Malay, uh, uh, as a background, Tyson Foods is one of the world's largest protein provider. The company has more than 80 years of experience with international presence in more than 100 countries. With the, uh, with the, enter, uh, with the entry into Malaysia in the past couple of years, Tyson Foods has been able to introduce global innovation, best practices uh, that would allow our production facilities in Malaysia to churn out and develop high quality, safe, and most importantly, tasty and delicious products for Malaysians. In that case, uh, I think it has actually been uh, an advantage of Tyson Foods being to bring in global expertise and combining with the local insights of our local Malaysian teams, uh, which is what I call the best of both worlds when it comes to new product development and ensuring there's good quality products being offered in the market. So what are your plans to elevate Malaysia's uh, significance in the Asian region from a supply chain and export perspective? So one interesting fact is that Malaysia is well recognized globally as the global halal food production hub. In fact, uh, Malaysia exports about 9 billion US dollars every year. That's close to 40 billion ringgit of halal products. A lot of the products from Malaysia then gets exported into the Middle East because products that are uh, certified by Jakim is well recognized uh, in, in the halal community. So uh, we see this as a huge opportunity for Malaysia to continue developing uh, its further processing and poultry capabilities so that we can continue as a country to be able to export products into the Middle East region. Now, Sean, let's move on to consumer food trends in Malaysia. How is the protein-based food market segment faring up in Malaysia? What are the key challenges in the protein-based and frozen food segment? I think with the recent pandemic, one of the things that has picked up very importantly or is of a lot of concern for consumers, it's with regards to the origin of food. Uh, where, is my, uh, where is the food that I'm consuming coming from? How was it actually being developed? So at Tyson Foods, we take a lot of pride and emphasis on this one. And we work uh, with suppliers, business partners that are actually all uh, halal certified, Jakim approved. And we work uh, with global, uh, house, uh, global innovation houses to make sure that we're actually able to introduce the best quality products in the market. So some example of this one would be in the recent launch of a Tyson branded products in Malaysia. And this was after many years of product development based on local consumer insights. So origin of food is definitely one of them. And the other one is really at the end of the day, regardless of what it is, food needs to be delicious, tasty. So we have a team of culinary experts as well as innovation team members looking at developing products that would uh, appeal and meet the local needs of consumers in Malaysia. Congratulations on your new uh, launch. It's definitely a good um, you know, achievement. So we're going to go about the challenges. How did the pandemic and supply chain disruption affect your business in terms of financial performance? What are some of the key learnings and SOP changes that Tyson adapted to during, the, during and after the pandemic? I think... I think the past two years during the pandemic was probably one of the most challenging times, not only for us, but across industries in that case. But as a company, we really emphasized on three key things that we wanted to make sure uh, that every team member in the company was adapting to. The first one was to really focus on winning with our customers and consumers. At the end of the day, uh, food uh, is an essential item. So we really wanted to make sure that our products are continued to be developed and being able to be uh, served to consumers and supplying our customers across the region. So winning with customers and consumers was the number one priority. Apart from that, during the pandemic, uh, winning with team members was of utmost importance for us because at the end of the day, the team members at Tyson Foods in Malaysia, the 1,500 team members that we have in the country uh, were the backbone behind the company. So the company put a lot of emphasis in terms of programs, well-being, making sure that every single team member is cared for. Now, with that in mind, the last priority was to execute or winning with execution excellence. That was where we had to be a lot more agile because things were changing on a daily basis, weekly basis, 
working together with our partners, our customers and crew members. What we have planned for did not turn out the way it had wanted to be. So we learned to be a lot more agile, a lot more nimble in terms of coming up uh, with new ways of doing things. And in line with that, at Tyson Foods Malaysia, we have now been investing uh, in upgrading, further upgrading of our facilities, investing in digitization, data analytics, automation. So we are trying to, uh, so we are better able to future future proof ourselves. Definitely, uh, it's good uh, improvement and initiative. So we can see, as we can see now with the data by Dawson, Malaysians are suffering from high food inflations. How will Tyson strike a balance between food qualities and even affordable pricing and input costs? Will high inflation weaken customer demands for company products? Uh, what's your perspective on this, Shan? I think at the end of the day, whether it's good times, bad times, food remains a priority. So consumption would be there. But having said that, as a company, we are well aware that we will not be able and we cannot pass through the inflation to our consumers. So this is where our innovation teams, our culinary team and the entire team uh, at Tyson Foods has been working around the clock to make sure that we come up with better ways to develop things. We are looking at efforts where we can improve productivity, efficiency, looking at ways where we could actually develop uh, new products with new ingredients so that we do not have to pass through the inflation uh, or consumer pr uh, uh, price pressures to our consumers. And the other example I've shared would be the recent launch of the uh, new range is one good example of that, where we really look through all the experience that we have. How do we develop a good tasting product, but still of value to consumers? So that has been the challenge to us. Instead of passing through all the costs uh, increases or inflation pressures to our consumers and customers. We have been working a lot harder to see how we can actually develop or derive efficiencies and productivity. All right, uh, that is definitely a good insight uh, on the how can we improve on food access and the innovations on food security. I would say definitely uh, thank you very much to Lee Yong Cheng, the Vice President of Commercial Tyson Food Internet International APEC. I want to say thank you very much. On a separate news, about 45% of Malaysian companies have still not allocated a budget for sustainability initiatives despite the growing trend of sustainability demands by the country's stakeholders, according to Malaysia Businesses Sustainability Pass Report 2022. The report was launched by the UN Global Compact Network Malaysia and Brunei. And the report also showed that 33% of Malaysian companies claimed a lack of sustainable financing plans. Furthermore, Sustainable Development Goals CDGs adoption remains worrying with nearly half or 47% of the Malaysian private sector indicating no commitments to the SDGs, while 34% of businesses indicate that the SDGs are not relevant to their businesses. However, the report the report suggests that this may be due to the overemphasis on environmental, social and governance ESG as a common sustainability language for the businesses, thus uh, under-prioritizing the SDGs. Joining us this morning is Arina Kok, Malaysia Climate Change and Sustainability Services Leader Ernst and Young or EY Sanjian Berhad. All right. Um, uh, in recent report, Malaysia Businesses Sustainability Pulse report this year by UN Global Compact Network Malaysia and Brunei, uh, there's about 45% uh, of Malaysian companies have still not allocated a budget for uh, sustainability initiatives. So what are some of the challenges for these companies uh, to allocate this budget? What do you think? Thank you. Um, a very good morning to everyone. We do see that uh, one of the key challenges is really focused on the um, misalignment uh, in terms of what ESG looks like for the corporate level or company level as compared to what the global international standards are looking at. So the lack of understanding on the ESG uh, management is actually one of the key um, challenges that companies are facing. Now, if we look at most uh, companies, they would have allocated budget for training, capability building, digitalization, um, as well as energy efficiency, energy savings. Now, all these are in fact ESG initiatives in a very uh, layman manner. So companies now need to, what they can do is really relook at their budget planning, their strategy, to see where their capital allocation uh, is very much focused on. And from there on, 
start to have the understanding of what are the environmental impact from their business expenditure or business plan moving forward. So with that context, it is not so much of allocating a budget for ESG initiatives, but really relooking from their corporate planning perspective where their financial spend is going to be, what are the outcomes to environment, social and governance when they are spending their money, whether it's on capital or whether it's operating expenditure. So I think that is one of the critical change of mindset um, that, that companies now need to take um, so that you know it, they, it's not seen as um, ESG, environmental, social and governance, is not seen as a silo, but it is an integral part of the company's uh, business model and business resilience. All right, talking about the need of critical change of mindset. Now, how we, we do have to go back. What's the level of ESG awareness amongst Malaysian companies? And what are the challenges for public, even private sectors to even move the sustainability initiatives? So when it comes to the level of awareness, quite a number of uh, companies are very much uh, in the past have been familiar with the triple uh, bottom line terminology, the people, profit and planet. Quite a number are also very uh, familiar with the 3R, reuse, recycle uh, and repurpose um, direction. Now, all these are evolution of where ESG is coming from and it's not uh, a, a new thing that, that we, we are seeing for businesses. The only evolution is looking at a longer term sustainability or longer term impact to um, the key stakeholders. So the challenge where we are seeing, the current landscape we are seeing is a number of companies are shifting from just uh, corporate social responsibility, donations, uh, cleaning up beaches, uh, volunteerism. All those will still be a mainstay for the short immediate uh, impact of what, where businesses is com uh, driving growth with community. But there is a clear shift, mindset shift that uh, ESG is becoming a more business sustainability consideration. What it means is, will the business still survive if consumers are changing their interests and behavior? For example, there has been a, a roadmap to zero single-use plastics that the government has put out. Now, all these policies will result in transformation, business transformation on the way they have been using, consuming plastics in their supply chain. Now, all these are going to be business strategy because it's disruptors and it affects the economics of the business model as well as there are consumers and stakeholders that the company are now being res held responsible to. So there is a clear shift of just from corporate social responsibility that are short and, and, and uh, short term to a broader, uh, longer term business sustainability where they have to relook at whether their business will be viable in the next 10, 20, 30, 50 years moving forward. So in terms of the current landscape that we're seeing, the awareness of the importance of ESG is fast becoming um, very, very, uh, uh, very critical because we, are, we have seen Bank Nagara Bursa and Securities Commission have pushed for enhanced regulations around the ESG uh, focus areas. And all these have also resulted in the banks, asset managers, insurers are also looking at ESG screening in their day-to-day -day financing. So what it means is, you know, in today's days of age, companies that, that are seeking for loans, seeking for investors, they now need to have a very clear ESG uh, strategy how these are affecting their business and how they are affecting community. And if this uh, clear articulation is not defined, businesses will face a challenge. But if it's clearly defined, measured, reported and communicated, businesses will find themselves in a better spot to actually navigate uh, and they are able to tap on uh, the benefits of brand customer loyalty. They are able to get better funding tapping on green and sustainable finance, they are able to then be at the forefront uh, to engage and understand where consumers or stakeholders uh, are increasing on their demand. So there's a clear shift of whether you are 
in the very proactive uh, space or you are still reacting and looking at uh, ESG as from a compliance and regulatory re requirement? All right. Um, uh, thank you very much for the very uh, good insight, uh, Irina Kol, uh, the Malaysian Climate Change and Sustainability Service Leader, Ernst and Yang Sudiran Berhad, on the insights how uh, companies can implement ESG and what's uh, impact on the future and how can we move forward with impl implementation of the sustainability and how it can make uh, improvement on a better future. So I want to say thank you very much on this insight. Uh, Nyagawani will be taking a short break and we'll be right back.